I want to turn to verse 32. This is what Paul says. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. This is the Greek word charizomai. One another, which is a reciprocal pronoun, as God in Christ forgave you. Why did I make note of the forgiving and the reciprocal pronoun? The charizomai is a unique word. A lot of people actually think that uh, Paul coined this word. He's kind of known for that, to making up uh, words. It is a type of forgiveness that is grace laced. So notice this, be kind, be tenderhearted. Remember the, the forgiveness that you received is, is a gracious type of forgiveness and then forgive others as, Christ, as God in Christ has forgiven you. If we embody these truths, if we embody this, what Paul tells us to do, it actually demands that we engage with our fellow human and especially our fellow brother or sister in Christ with a sense of compassion that mirrors the compassion that God had with us. And I want to turn to one last uh, example in the Bible is the book of Job. And I think Job's three friends, we all know the story, talk about an individual who is just going through all kinds of chaos. And I actually think his three friends, they get a really bad rep in, in the story, but they do a lot right. They sit there in com a moment of compassion. Um, the place where things go wrong is when they open their mouths and they start to talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually an indication that the friends are operating out of assumptions. And when you operate out of assumptions, it's liable and an indication, I think, that maybe you don't have a sense of tender heartedness. Maybe there might be some lack of compassion. Um, maybe uh, we're, we're working in a place where we just haven't listened to the other person because if we're listening to them, that listening and understanding of where they are, as we step in to provide dis discipleship and discipline and accountability, it informs the listening, informs our words, it informs our works, it informs everything. But Jim, I actually think something else is happening to Job that I've just been thinking about as we've been in this session. When the friends begin to, they're working out a retributional theology, like Job, you must have sinned in all of these ways. These must have been a type of shame scripts that have been running through Job's mind. So how does Job respond? Like, what do you actually do in that situation? Well, and also the friends, you know, you're talking about assumptions. Yeah. They probably have their own oh, shame yeah. scripts Ooh. because remember, they're going to speak out of their shame scripts if they're not careful. And those shame scripts make us have wrong perceptions or assumptions mm -hmm. about ourselves, others, and God. Yeah. So they're almost speaking like, yeah, you must have done something, right. Job, in order for this to be happening. So they're making a perception, judgment, or an assumption about God yeah. and God's motives here. So and the therapy word there is projection. It's my stuff, it really is. Without even knowing it, I will speak that up. And it's kind of like what to do. So even in my own life, where we started the show personal, we'll come back personal. Martin Luther, the great theologian said, you cannot keep those thought birds, and I'm going to borrow Luther wouldn't mind, you can't keep those shame scripts birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. We have bird boxes all over our backyard. No blue bird has flown with an entire, look like purchased at Hobby Lobby nest. That's how they look inside the box and gone through the little hole, one piece of pine straw at a time. So we know of course what? 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and let us not forget verse 4. There are strongholds in our lives, things that would come up against arguments against God and His truth and what He has said. And these strongholds can be loaded with shame scripts. So what do you do? It's an active program. Take every, not every other, not every one in five. Take every thought captive, but wait. And people go, I do, I do. No, make it obedient to Christ and His truth. And with that, I use a word, very practical often I'll say, and I'll say it out loud because I hear myself resonate and say, I refuse that thought. I mean, activate it. Remember, these shame scripts are never out loud. You can kick the decibel level up by speaking out loud. They're always silent. They feel out loud. But to say, I refuse that thought. And then literally find a way to say, Jesus, that is a lie. This is the truth. This is who I am in Christ. And, and, and get you a bunch of I am statements of who you are in Christ to speak over. You know what? Those shame scripts will begin to get softer and softer in the background. And even if they come up one time again, once a week, once a month, answer everyone. And that's what I've seen both clinically, theologically, is people let those things build back up, back up, often coming from childhood. It's time to start answering those shame scripts with the truth. 
That's so good. And just a reminder, how do I know if this is shame and I need to take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ? Or how do I know if it's conviction? Because I really should feel a little bit of conviction or yeah. prompting because this is maybe taking me to a place that wouldn't be good or I'm dabbling in sin. How do we know the difference? Shame is going to tell you, you are something wrong. It's attacking the very essence of who you are. And if it does not line up with the fact that, yeah, there's some dust, there's some broken off bone, but ultimately at the end of the day, I am breath of God. I am touch of God, design of God, made in the image of God. So if it's attacking who you are, that's a shame script. If it's attacking something that you are doing, that's something to pay attention to because maybe that's conviction meant to prevent you from diving deeper into that sin.